taken our <coughs> reading this morning from Psalm 136. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endures forever. I want to speak this Thanksgiving week from the subject of a reason for Thanksgiving. A reason for Thanksgiving. It's this time of year where our country, our nation, our societies come together and set aside a time of Thanksgiving. It's one of, I guess, the purest holidays that we in this country celebrate, although it is often tainted with distractions of shopping, parades, football, which things which are not necessarily evil, but can often pull us away from the real meaning of what we're doing here, and what this time of year is about. And if anybody ought to be able to lead in the true meaning of thanksgiving, it should be the people of God. The church should be the best example of what real thanksgiving is about. There are many verses of scripture that call us to be thankful. Colossians says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Read also, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in all circumstances. You'll note that it doesn't say be thankful for all circumstances. No one expects you to be grateful when disaster hits your life, when financial ruin comes your way, when death plagues loved ones of your family. It's not saying to be thankful for all the circumstances, but no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, you should be thankful to God. There is a difference between being thankful for something and being thankful in something. We see this demonstrated by our Lord Himself. On the night He was crucified, for I pass on to you what I received, from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Realize that he had just been betrayed by one of his closest friends. This was the night that he knew as he was announcing that he was going to be tortured and murdered. And yet, in that circumstance, we find our Lord giving thanks. It's unfortunate that it seems like the only time we can be thankful is when we're getting stuff. When good things are happening for us, we get that new car, we're very thankful. Get a new job, you get that new girlfriend. <laughs> you love, you're thankful. I find that the need, the cause for thankfulness can be found very early in the scriptures. You open up your Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over 
the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Right out the gate, we see God doing something for us. God made light. Who did he make the light for? Not for him. It's not like he had a problem seeing in the dark. The light was for you. Before we even got here, God is making provisions for us. And on top of all that is after man sins and betrays God, we don't see God turning the lights off like some of us might have done. Like, you do this to me, turn the lights off. How do you like me now? But we don't see God doing that even when man falls and disobeys God, disobeys God. We see the love of God continuous. Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It says, I give you my peace. He continues, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Peace and joy are gifts from God that you can't get anywhere else. That means if you never have a job and you got Jesus, you got so much to be thankful for. One time I was sitting meditating and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, when your wife brings you a meal several times a day, do you suppose that she's supposed to do that? <laughs> and, and of course I'm thinking, well, sort of. <laughs> but he showed me that that's not something that she's required to do. And so the conviction came that I need to say thank you when she does those kinds of things. I see all the women shaking their heads. <laughs> Why? Because an unspoken and unexpressed thankfulness is useless. There's a scripture that says, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. The King James uses the word, do all things without murmuring and dispute. It's a word that we find often in the King James Version from the time of Moses and the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. So, for example, when we go to Exodus, the 16th chapter, Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmur. Continuing down, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. <coughs> Murmuring is a very peculiar word. In other translations, you read complain. But murmuring actually finds its way into our medical definitions with a heart murmur. There's a thing called a heart murmur. And what it means 
is that it's subtle. It's quiet. It's not something that's overtly obvious. You have to kind of listen in, but it's there. This subtle sound, this whispering sound, that's a defect in a heart, a heart murmur. That's how the people of God sometimes are. Not overly and outwardly complaining, but we have that quiet murmur. You see it on Facebook. There are people that everything that goes wrong in their life, they post it up on Facebook. You go on their wall and you can find everything listed, itemized, right down through the day of things that have not gone right in their lives. And it seems like unless they're telling you what's not working, they got nothing to say. And so you see posts, your alarm clock didn't go up this morning, late for work, up. And it's those little murmurs that don't seem very sinful, but they don't really seem to express the joy of the Lord. How about posting things like, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. What are we thankful for? Be thankful for our salvation. Are we thankful for our church? Be thankful for our pastor. <clears throat> we all know the story of the prodigal son. It's one of the most famous parables of Jesus. And in the story, he talks about two sons. The younger son comes. He says, I'm out of here. Give me my stuff. Give me what belongs to me. And I'm leaving. So the young boy gets paid. He takes off. He lives his life riotously, having a party. He's partying down. And then he runs out of money. Nobody's giving him anything. And he's sitting there eating with the pigs. The boy comes to himself, realizes there's got to be a better way. He opts to go return to his father. His father, to his surprise and delight, receives him with joy and glad, takes him back as if nothing happened, and he throws a party for him. He celebrates, and there's music and dancing <coughs> and thanksgiving for the lost boy who has come home. But let's pick up the story from the elder son. And we pick up from verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son, was in the field. And when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. His response, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The oldest son responded with anger that he didn't even want to go into the house. It's a sad, sad state when you can't rejoice unless it's about you. Oh, I'm preaching hard now. You can't sing a song unless it's a song you know. You can't clap your hands unless they're playing a song that you like. What's wrong with getting happy just because somebody else is being blessed? Can you rejoice even though it has nothing to do with you, but you're just glad to see that somebody else is happy. The story goes, his response, because he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. So now he's arguing with the father 
You never gave me anything. His response was, you did it all for him, but for me, you never gave. Well, is that really true? When you look at the beginning of the parable, it starts off like this. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. He didn't just give the younger his part. He also gave the elder son. And yet he's standing there complaining, you never gave me. Unthankfulness can distort memories. In my years, I have done my share of marital counseling. And when I meet with a couple, usually within five minutes, I can tell if there's a problem in the marriage. I don't have to hear about any problems that they're going through or what brought them into the office in the first place. But I can usually pick it up and this is how I do it. I ask them questions like, tell me about when you first met. Tell me what your dating life was like. Talk to me about your wedding day. Your wedding day. And then I listen for the answers. Sometimes I get answers, or he was just so cute, came down in his little tuxedo. But then I, sometimes I hear, well, he never really took me anywhere I wanted to go. And see, that's telling me. That's how you remember your days. That's how you remember your past. Unthankfulness can have, give you distorted memories. So the person that you fell in love with, five years later, you can't think of anything good that happens anymore. This is what we find in the wilderness with the murmuring and complaining. Here they are in the wilderness, in a granted and uncomfortable situation, and they complain. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. We had all the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlics we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this man. They're looking back now and saying, we had it made in Egypt. Look at what we're going through now. The fact is, it was never like that in Egypt. This is what it was like in Egypt. It was oppression. It was bondage. It was slavery. But their memories are now distorted. And now they think they were better off back in their bondage. There's a story of King David. There's a time when the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, the power of God, it was taken away. For a long period of time, they didn't have it. And through a course of events, the Ark is returned and marched into the city of David. The story tells us in Samuel 6, but the Ark of the Lord entered the city of David. Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. She was filled with contempt for him. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today shamelessly exposing himself to the servant's girls like a vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michal, I was dancing before the Lord, who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. David's response was, 
I'm doing this for God. I'm dancing before the Lord. When you see me carrying on, it has nothing to do with you. But I'm celebrating before God. The psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Another translation puts it like this. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. There comes a time when you can't worry about what others are thinking. You can't worry about how you look to the person sitting next to you. There comes a time when you just have to lift your hands and praise God for all that he has done for you. Because when I think on the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. You may not be where I am, but when I look back on what God has done for me, it stirs up a thank you, Jesus. When I see how he brought me out, when I see where he has brought me to, how he has delivered me, the times when I was sick, the times when I felt like giving up, the times when I was confused, and yet he never let me go. He always put his arms around me and let me know that he was there. And when I think back on all of that, I just have to say thank you. I might not have my bills paid, but thank you, Jesus. I might not have a job to go to, but thank you, Jesus. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Hallelujah. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I have to say thank you. When I see how he has brought me through, I got a reason to praise him. I got a reason to bless him. Even when I'm down, even when I feel like giving up, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will always be in my mouth. I got a reason to praise God. I got a reason to thank God.